The president of Argentina, Alberto Fernandez, ends his international tour in Barbados with a meeting with the prime minister of the country, Mia Matli. Currently, 10,581,000 Cubans have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, making it the third country in the world with this indicator. In Colombia, the death toll from the landslide that occurred early Tuesday morning in the municipality of Pereira in the department of Rosalda rises to 14. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. The president of Argentina, Alberto Fernandez, ends his international tour in Barbados with a meeting with the prime minister of that country, Mia Motley. This morning, after visiting the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China and holding meetings with his peers, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, the Argentinian president made a last stop in his tour on to meet with recently elected Mia Matli and representatives of the countries of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. During the talks, topics like climate change and the sovereignty claim over the Malvinas Islands were discussed. Fernandez's meetings with those leaders are aimed at deepening relations with the Caribbean countries that are members of CELAC. The president of Argentina will return to his country tonight to resume the domestic agenda with the agreement with the IMF as the national government's priority. Argentine justice resumes the trial of crimes against humanity committed during the 1976 to 1983 military dictatorship. The case is about the atrocities that took place in three clandestine detention centers in the province of Buenos Aires, known as Pozo de Banfield, Pozo de Quilmes, and Brigada de Lanús. The hearing, which takes place this Tuesday and is broadcast live on digital platforms, is attended by relatives of the victims to give their testimonies. The Federal Oral Court of La Plata, in this case, is judging 18 repressors who acted in those clandestine centers. This case was first brought to trial in April 2012, where the human rights groups Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, led the lawsuit. In Colombia, in the last two polls on voting intentions for the presidential elections, the candidate for the historical pact continues to lead, but the blank vote and the undecided voter add up to a large percentage. The most recent survey conducted by the Latin American Strategic Center for Geopolitics shows a growth in the popularity of the candidate for the historical pact, Gustavo Pedro, with about 28% of the voting intention of the population consulted, followed by Alejandro Char, while Sergio Fajardo is in the third place. The study also shows that 11% of those polled will vote no and void, while 15% will not vote. On Tuesday, the Venezuelan High Command of the Bolivarian National Armed Forces informed they continue their advance in operations against the so-called Tancal groups, who are armed groups, terrorist Colombian drug traffickers. The strategic operational commander of the FANB, Domingo Hernandez, took to Twitter and pointed out that as part of the search and capture operations, infrastructures of these criminal organizations were dismantled and hundreds of explosive devices were deactivated. The main epicenter of the FANB operations is the southwestern state of Apure, with the objective of neutralizing the paramilitary groups that intend to take control of the border to develop their criminal activities. During a recent speech accompanied by the military high commander, President Nicolás Maduro Moros stated that in 2022, Venezuela must achieve the total eradication of these paramilitary groups, which systematically try to incursion through the border to settle the national territory. And Cuba sets the details of the celebration of the 120th anniversary of the birth of the national poet Nicolás Guillén with a variety agenda of activities. The event is scheduled to take place from July 7th to 10th this year in Camagüey, the writer's hometown. 
The 13th edition to the Nicolas Guillén Colloquium and Festival stands out among these proposals. The event will also focus on the relations between race, nation and society in the greater of the Antilles, as well as in other territories such as the United States. Black Lives Matter movement will also be part of the topics to discuss. The program will include exhibitions, book presentations, musical performances and academic spaces. The foundation that honors the artists informed that it will continue the work of preserving, studying and disseminating the legacy of Nicolas Guillén. Ya nos veremos, yo y tú, juntos en la misma. Now we update the situation in Costa Rica, where the Supreme Court of Elections, the TSE, began this Tuesday the definitive scrutiny of the general elections held last February 6. The electoral body pointed out that with more than 80% of the total of the election boards processed, the citizen participation, the turnout, was 59.01%, of which Jose Maria Figueres, the candidate for the Party Liberation Nacional, obtained more than 27% of the votes to be in the first place and to be measured in the second round with Jose Maria Figueres, the candidate for the Party's Social Democratic Progress, who managed to position itself in the second place with 16. Similar results are shown in relation to the parliamentary race in which national liberation reached 142,191 votes for 24.24 percent, followed by social democratic progress with 99,077 votes, which represents 17.01 percent. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. Currently, 10,581,000 Cubans have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, making it the third country in the world with this indicator. Only the United Arab Emirates and Portugal surpass Cuba. To date, according to the Ministry of Public Health, over 34 million doses of the national biological vaccine Abdallah from the Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, as well as Soberano 2 and Soberana Plus from the Finland Institute of Vaccines have been applied in the country. From the beginning of the epidemic, a scientific strategy was designed and based on Cuba's own immunizers, avoiding at all costs the brutal competition to which biotechnology centers in other parts of the world are subjected to. The island has also provided vaccines for nations such as Iran, Venezuela, Vietnam, Nicaragua, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Mexico and Syria. And France will lift the mandatory COVID-19 testing for all travelers outside the European Union, the EU, who have been vaccinated. The measure was announced on Tuesday by the Secretary of State for European Affairs, Clement Byrne, who said that the vaccinated travelers from outside the European Union or the UK will have to present a negative PCR or antigen test within 48 hours and will be allowed to enter the country only if they are traveling for essential reasons. The new rule is launched in the midst of an increase in the number of COVID-19 cases per day in France. The European nation is currently the country with the fourth highest number of infections since the beginning of the pandemic behind the United States, Brazil and India. Now we move on to other topics. A group of U.S. soldiers arrived on Tuesday in Romania as part of the military buildup of the nation in Eastern Europe as border issues between Russia, Ukraine and NATO continue. 
The deployment adds up to another one taking place in Poland on Saturday after the U.S. announced at the start of this month the sending of 3,000 additional troops to Eastern Europe. This transpires amid a new wave of Western pressures against Moscow, with politicians and media outlets orchestrating an alleged invasion from Russia to Ukrainian territory. These accusations have been deemed by Russian authorities as unfounded, while they have also affirmed they do not seek to be a threat to anyone. Likewise, more American troops and equipment arrived in Poland on Tuesday. The soldiers landed at Reskov Jazyonka Airport, which is some 90 kilometers from Polish Ukrainian border. The arrival came following President Joe Biden's orders to deploy 1,700 soldiers. Biden ordered additional U.S. troops deployed to Poland and Germany, eastern flank amid rising tensions between Russia and Ukraine. Soldiers joined a few dozen elite U.S. who landed at the airport on Sunday. And Palestinians mourned the death of three men shot by Israeli troops in the West Bank city of Nablus. Palestinians gathered at the funeral of three men who were killed in a vehicle riddled by bullet holes by Israeli troops, who justified the killings with a supposed raid against a terrorist cell. Two of the three victims were identified as Adham Mabruk and Muhammad al dakil Their bodies were sent to the Rafidia hospital after the occupation forces fired tear gas against the car and also the bullets in which they were traveling. The Palestinian Foreign Ministry said in a statement that it holds the Israeli government, headed by Naftali Bennett, fully and directly responsible for the heinous crime. Prisoners in Israeli jails in occupied Palestine declared a state of general mobilization in the face of repression by Zionist forces, a measure that Palestinians inside and outside the occupied territories are calling on to support until all prisoners, without exception, are released. Let us see. The Israeli occupation authority, since the escape of six Palestinians from the Gilboa maximum security prison last September 2021, increased arbitrary arrest rates and punitive measures against prisoners, a situation that provoked an explosion, strikes and clashes inside and outside the prisons in rejection of the escalating repressive measures of the Tel Aviv regime against the inmates and in repudiation of the silence of the world community in the face of the aggressive Israeli policy. We call on international human rights organizations to adopt a clear and forceful position and to put pressure on the Israeli prison service to stop the repressive measures against Palestinian prisoners. Otherwise, we, as resistance forces, will not stand by and watch the suffering of our fellow prisoners, and so we will proceed to armed confrontation with Israeli occupation troops. We work to make the Palestinian prisoners' case a world public opinion case in order to increase popular and official support, both locally and internationally, for the prisoners' battle against repression by Israeli prison guards. Like the Palestinians in the occupied territories, the brothers living in Syria express their solidarity with the prisoners and their support for their battle for freedom, in addition to exhibiting in Damascus a documentary on the chaotic situation suffered by detainees in occupation prisons, the leaders of the different Palestinian factions and their Syrian brothers awarded numerous released captives in a clear message of support for their cause and their general mobilization against Israeli repression. This tribute to the released prisoners sends a clear message of support to the prisoners who still remain in occupation jails, where they suffer torture and mistreatment, and to these heroes we send the message that we stand with them in the battle for their freedom. We do not trust international organizations, because when I was in occupation prisons, I suffered a lot from the lack of action of these organizations, for they submit to the will of the United States, European countries and Israel, and act without coordinating with Israeli authorities regarding the case of prisoners.
More than 4,500 Palestinians, including women and minors, are languishing in the prisons of the Israeli-occupying power. Their battle is the battle of all Palestinians and other free peoples of the world, a reality that is evidenced by the numerous acts of solidarity with the prisoners taking place both in Syria and in the other countries of the resistance bloc. Lord, and now we continue to other topics. Syrian authorities reported that Kul repelled a new missile attack by Israeli forces. According to the information from the Syrian Ministry of Defense, the missile blast was shot down by the rapid response capability of the Syrian Army anti-aircraft battery. In the communique broadcast by the national television, they reported that Israeli planes fired bursts of missiles from the Rayak area, east of Lebanon's capital, targeting some points in the vicinity of Damascus. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. In Colombia, the death toll from the landslide that occurred early Tuesday morning in the municipality of Pereira, in the department of Risalda, rises to 14. Authorities reported that search and rescue efforts continue after an undetermined number of people remain trapped in the houses of the sector. The landslide caused by heavy rains caused the destruction of 20 houses after the Otun River that crosses the area also overflowed. Local authorities also reported the evacuation of dozens of houses located in the area of the landslide. The National Disaster Management Unit reported that this has been the worst tragedy in the middle of the current rainy season. In the last 10 summers, in the Brazilian state of Sao Paulo, registered 223 deaths due to floods. This problem is every time more frequent because of climate change. Specialists assure that the situation also exposes the deficiencies of the housing policies in Brazil. And mud slides in Sao Paulo increased by 34 and evacuated or displaced families now tally up for 5,277. According to the United Nations, the heavy rains are 0.3 more frequent and 6.7 percent more intense. Extreme weather events find an environment vulnerable to catastrophes due to the lack of urban planning and housing programs that today are at the hands of speculative real estate companies. It is impossible for the people who have minimum wage, even those with two, to access housing programs. So we have no land and no place for people to build their own houses in well-located areas. Add to that the lack of housing policies that include this sector of the population. As a result, there are plenty of irregular areas for the most vulnerable families, territories with environmental frailty and where the market cannot enter. After the mudslides, President Jair Bolsonaro blamed the victims. In many of these areas where the houses were built, there was a lack of future planning, just like people build in these at-risk areas out of necessity. Sao Paulo has 132,000 properties in high-risk areas, and Joao Doria's government uses less than its 2021 budget for infrastructure against floods. At a federal level, Bolsonaro cut off all of the popular housing programs like Minha Casa, Minha Vida. Also, families who benefited from these initiatives launched during Rousseff's administration do not have the resources anymore to keep their houses. 76 percent of Brazilian families are indebted. Many families got out of these areas at risk. They went to that housing program and since they couldn't stay there, they went back to the areas at risk. But once they go back, they happen to do so in worse areas than before. Extreme weather events are increasingly frequent and mostly affect low-income families who, due to the lack of housing policies, face more and more danger 
each year in areas of high environmental risk. Thank you, Ignacio, for this report, and now we continue to other topics. Drought conditions have left an estimated 13 million people facing severe hunger in the Horn of Africa, according to the United Nations World Food Program. People in the region, including Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya, are facing the driest conditions recorded since 1981. The agency reported on Tuesday, calling for immediate assistance to forestall a major humanitarian crisis. Drought conditions are affecting pastoral and farming communities across southern and southeastern Ethiopia, southeastern and northern Kenya, and south-central Somalia. Malnutrition rates are high in the region. WHP said that it needs 200... $327 million to look after the urgent needs of 4.5 million people over the next six months and help communities become more resilient to extreme climate shocks. Down the track into a fourth consecutive poor rainy season, then we really are looking at more uncharted territory. And those situations that we saw on the television screens in 2011 and also 2017 uh, could be where we're, uh, where we're heading. But we're already seeing these consecutive drought episodes really biting for communities. And that's why WFP urgently requires $327 million in order to reach 4.5 million of the worst affected people in those areas with relief food assistance uh, and with uh, treatment and prevention of acute malnutrition, which is all very, already very much uh, on, on the rise uh, in the region. And like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.